Hello, and thank you for joining me for this webinar on the Advisory Council in Comprehensive School Counseling Programs. I am Sarah Kirk, and I work for the Oklahoma State Department of Education as the School Counselor Specialist. And our department at the Department of Education serves schools, families, and students. So of course, that means we are here to support school counselors as well. It is our goal that to help you build comprehensive school counseling programs that support all of your students that support all of your families and that have positive outcomes for all. So today is a part of that. As we dive in today, we are going to be talking about the advisory council. We'll talk about how it fits into that national model, all about what it is and the templates included, the implementation steps. We'll take a look at an example from when I was a school counselor in the school setting. We will have a reflection and a summary. If you've joined me on my previous webinars, you've heard me say this before, but this quote is never more important than as we dive into advisory councils. Advisory councils can be so incredibly beneficial to our school counseling programs. In fact, I think it's one of the most beneficial pieces but it can be a little bit overwhelming. I'm giving you the heads up now. Today's webinar as we dive into advisory council is not the easiest. It's not the one that just like this, you'll have implemented and done. But like I said, they are so, so, so beneficial. So keep this quote in mind. I will continue to remind it to you because there will be steps of what we talk about today that might seem like a little bit too much. And that's okay. If that's too much right now, put that on the back burner and move forward with what's not too much, with what you feel comfortable doing. That is still good. And we will not let perfect be the enemy of good. Remember, in comprehensive school counseling, every step we take towards a comprehensive school counseling program better serves our students. We will not get there overnight. It is not a magic wand and it's done. It is a process. It is meant to be a process. It's a process so that your students end up with the best possible outcomes. But let's dive in. The Advisory Council and how it fits into the ASCA national model. Hopefully you've joined me for other webinars, so I'm going to fly through this part, but we know in the ASCA national model, we have those four components, define, manage, deliver, and assess, and together those give us an outline for a comprehensive school counseling program that has positive outcome for all students. When we implement a school counseling program that is based off the ASCA national model, our decisions are based in data, our, still, our services are delivered to all students, and of course we know that that means the, they have that improved student achievement, attendance, and discipline. We are able to make those positive outcomes as a result of this comprehensive program that includes all of those four components, define, manage, deliver, and assess. Today, we're talking about that advisory council, and the advisory council is under that manage component. So hopefully you've joined in on some of the other webinars that we've done, and you'll notice here that the advisory council is highlighted under that manage component. If you see these words on the screen and you have questions about the other components, or if as I talk about the advisory council, I mention something that you're not sure how to implement, please go back and watch that webinar, or please go back and get the Ask a National Model fourth edition book to learn more about that because today we're just diving into the advisory council under that manage component. So let's talk just a little bit about that manage component. We know that the manage component is the behind the scenes work. It cannot be ignored because it is very, very important that we strategically plan and manage our school counseling program so that when we get ready to provide those direct student services under the deliver component, that we've really managed our, our program so well that then those deliver 
deliver components can be extra strong. If we jump to deliver and we don't manage our program first, sometimes that's when those random acts of counseling happen, right? We might be delivering services, but they're not based on the data. They're not aligned with our goals. They aren't well thought out. That's why the manage component is so important. The manage component includes quite a bit of different elements, and you'll see them listed here on the screen. And again, I'm doing webinars on each of those so that none of them feel too overwhelming. We're really breaking it down step by step, because like we said, that's how good comprehensive school counseling is implemented, step by step, not all at once. It's way too much. But today we're going to talk about making sure that advisory council is implemented. So let's talk about what it is. Like I said at the beginning, I think this component of the national model is pretty misunderstood. I've presented on this topic before and had a lot of blank stares and a lot of wide eyes. So I understand that this piece can be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit hard to understand. So I have broken it down in little chunks for us today so we can really talk about it. So what the advisory council is, is it is a group of stakeholders that are selected to be your group to review and advise the implementation of your school counseling program. This advisory council's main focus is your school counseling program. It gives those stakeholders a voice to come and look at what's happening in your school counseling program and to help you through dialogue and also through critique. So essentially, this is just a group that comes together just twice a year to help really strengthen your school counseling program by giving their input. So I'm gonna pause there because some of you might already be surprised. I know often when I talk about the advisory council, people think it's the same as like advisory period in the high school schedule or something like that. Or they think maybe it's an advisory within your school that you're a, a member of. Those might be happening in your schools, you might have those, but this advisory council is different. I'm gonna pause there. This advisory council is a group of stakeholders that come together for the sole purpose of, of supporting your school counseling program, okay? So this advisory council is not also the science advisory council or the PTA or the parent group that is advocating for bullying prevention. All of those things might be happening. They are not the same as your advisory council. Your advisory council is a group of stakeholders whose sole purpose is I hope you can say it. <laughs> yes, its sole purpose is supporting your school counseling program. Okay, so now that we have that cleared up, let's talk a little bit about how an advisory council assists school counselors. So your advisory council will advise on your annual student outcome goals. So you'll share those goals with them and they can advise you their thoughts and their perspectives on those goals. They can also help you re review the results of your annual student outcome goals. They can make recommendations about the school counseling program. They can help you advocate and engage in public relations for your school counseling program. And they can advocate for funding and resources. This is just a few of the things. There are other things they can do, but this kind of summarizes it. They're really there to be your group that knows about the inner workings of your school counseling program and then can help you strengthen that school counseling program. So when we start thinking about creating this group, remember, it's not a group that already exists. It's not an add-on to a different committee or a different group. So because it doesn't already exist, we have to create it. 
And in order to create it well, we need to consider a couple of really important items. The first thing we need to consider is the purpose. We need to make sure that the purpose and the function are set in advance and that every member understands what that purpose is. I recommend at the beginning of every meeting reviewing what the purpose of the advisory council is. I also encourage you to review what the purpose of comprehensive school counseling is because we want to make sure this advisory council has a really strong understanding of what we're supposed to do. That way they're more likely to understand what they're supposed to do. So that clear purpose is very, very important. We also need really broad representation on this advisory council. So it's going to be a committee of people it is often students, parents, teachers, of course, school counselors, administrators, school board members, and business and community members. So it's a diverse group. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the various roles I included on mine. I always had an upper grade teacher. I was in elementary school, so I had an upper grade teacher, like a fourth or fifth grade teacher, a lower grade teacher, I had a specialist, so like a music teacher or a PE teacher, a teaching assistant. I wanted one of those support staff members to be on my, account, my advisory council as well, and then an administrator. So I usually had five school employees, upper level teacher, lower level teacher, specialist, teaching assistant, and a principal. So there's those five. Then I also often invited outside people, people from outside of my school. That included our school superintendent. You might be thinking there's no way my superintendent will attend. I thought that was the case too, but I invited him and he came and he was an active member on my advisory council. I'll talk more about that as we go on. I also always invited the school counseling director. We had a director of school counseling in our district. I really wanted her there to make sure she understood what my comprehensive school counseling program was doing. And I wanted her input on my advisory council. She was a wealth of knowledge. It's also good if you can have a school board member or some sort of community member that's representative of the community, maybe even two or three, depending on your community and what type of diversity you have. Parents, it's very important to have caregivers or parents on your advisory council. And with your parents, I want you to think about not just the parent who's involved in everything, right? Because that parent probably already has a lot on their plate, but maybe thinking of the parent who is not so involved, but might really be able to be really impactful on your advisory council. And you can have more than one, so maybe a couple. And then also students. Like I said, I was at elementary and I still always had students on my advisory council. If you're middle school or high school, obviously it's even easier, but I always had students. And just like with the caregivers, I tried to make sure it wasn't just the student that was already really involved in everything. Typically I had two or three students. One of them might have been the student council president or something like that. But then the other ones I tried to make sure brought a diverse perspective that maybe weren't as involved in those student groups so that everyone um, was a little more representative of our school population. So representation is really important. We want them to represent the community's values and concerns and interests. I think I talk more about this in a minute, but it, we don't just want people that are going to be really agreeable and not have a lot of constructive criticism for us. Because again, the purpose of an advisory council is to strengthen our school counseling program. If they're just silent members that just listen to us talking at them, it's not as beneficial. It's not as constructive. So think through those people who will share and give feedback. 
We also want to think about the size. So you can see there, I mentioned the people I typically had, and that was about 12 people usually. ASCA rec rec um, recommends between eight and 20. It kind of depends on your school and your environment. Of course, if you have a team of school counselors, you might only have one advisory council for your whole team. So then there might be more of you because there might be just like three or four school counselors. So obviously, if there are four school counselors present, you don't want only eight members because then that's not a diverse enough group. That's only four non-school counselors. So in that situation, you might have more, but we want to be really careful to not get too big where people won't talk. I find that if it's too small or too big, people are less likely to share and have purposeful discussion. So somewhere in that sweet spot is best. Also keep in mind that not everyone will always be able to come. So making sure that you have enough present at the meeting. So if you only have a group of eight and two can't make it, you can see where that might be a little bit troublesome because it's not a very big group. And appropriate candidates. We already talked about this a little bit, but we want members with a sincere interest in the school counseling program, right? We don't want the negative Nancy's that just come in and don't have anything constructive, but just want to complain about things. But we also don't want people that are too agreeable and can't be helpful or won't be helpful. Once we have decided on those appropriate candidates, we want to officially invite them. So we will look in a minute about at an example letter that I would send to my potential members. ASCA has one in the National Model Implementation Guide as well, but that is a good way to officially invite them. We don't want this to be one of those things that you passing by in the hall invite the third grade teacher to this. We want them to understand the purpose of this. So that would be included in that letter. And what we want them to agree to participate. So if we write them a letter, we're asking them, we're inviting them to participate. If they're not interested, we'll take that and we'll invite somebody else. Okay. So we don't want to just assume that they want to be a part of it. We want people who really have the time and energy to commit to this. It's also great if at that time we can provide the dates and times for all meetings of the year. Remember, there's just usually two. Sometimes we might have extra and we'll talk about that in a minute, but typically just two. But we do want to provide those dates and times so that the candidates know what they're committing to. Oftentimes, an advisory council will have a chairperson. So this could be one of the school counselors on your committee in your advisory council. It could be someone else. It could be you. There's some flexibility there, but we do want someone who has that skill set in group facilitation planning and conducting meetings to kind of be our, our advisory council chairperson. Again, if you're a lone wolf school counselor on your own, that might most likely be you. But if you have a team, then you can pick who you want that to be based on skill set and willingness to do so. Membership terms. Once we are inviting our members, we want to make sure they understand what the term limit is or how long they'll serve on our advisory council. Typically, it's one to three years. I have found that the more years the same people stay on the advisory council, the better in some ways, because they're more experienced. You're not always having to just spend all your time talking about what it is you do as an advisory council. But with that, if the committee stays exactly the same for 10 years, well, we know why that might be ineffective. We might see just some, well, this is how we've always done it type mentality, and we don't want to do that. So typically, maybe I would probably lean closer to that three-year term with hopefully where you have some staggering terms. So not everyone rolls off at the same time. I find that happens naturally because even with three-year terms, people move or can no longer commit. So you invite someone new in. So then of course you have a stagger. 
All right, and with our advisory council, we'll also have agenda and minutes. Again, this is a formal meeting. This is not an add-on to a different meeting. This is not a quick conversation in the hallway. So because it's a formal meeting, we need a formal agenda and minutes. Luckily, ASCA has templates for us, so we'll look at those in a little bit. But when we are creating those agendas, keep in mind that we need to specifically identify topics. We want to include data in those presentations. That's really, really important. We wanna make sure they understand what our comprehensive school counseling program is doing and data is a great way to show that. Same with those results reports. We also wanna send the minutes of previous meetings and the agenda to the upcoming meeting several days in advance. So again, just like any other formal board or group would do, we wanna provide that so that they can review the previous minutes, review the upcoming agenda. If they have any questions or comments to be added to the agenda, that gives them time to do so. We wanna make sure that the agenda does provide time to reflect and discuss. I made the very big mistake the first time I ever had an advisory council where I filled the agenda so much that we didn't have enough time to really reflect. And my group wanted that. They wanted time to discuss what they had learned and I had really filled the agenda way too full. So while we definitely want to have some items included on that agenda, we wanna make sure we leave that time for reflection and discussion, suggestions, recommendations, that sort of thing. It's also good to have an action required section of your minutes so that when you discuss things and upcoming plans, that sort of thing, you assign people to do those different action items. And we'll talk more about that as we go. And of course, we want to be respectful of the members' time. So we're going to begin on time and end on time. Okay, so those are the main things we want to consider when we're starting to create this counseling advisory, I'm sorry, advisory council. I always want to call it a counseling advisory, but advisory council. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what the meetings actually look like. So remember, we said it's just typically just two formal meetings. Um, usually there's one in the fall and one in the spring. There are occasions when you might need more and we'll talk about that shortly. In that fall meeting, so typically I would say October-ish, give the school year a little bit of time to get going, make sure you have your goals written, data collected from the previous year, that sort of thing. So typically October is probably best. We'll have that fall meeting. The fall meeting, typically includes a quick summary or review of the council's purpose. And that's assuming you've met before. If this is your first meeting and a fall meeting, you would wanna spend a little bit of time talking about your purpose. Remember, we wanna really make sure that advisory council members understand what their role is on the council. We wanna make sure what that they understand what your role as a school counselor is because we cannot assume that they know the appropriate role of a school counselor. Many of them probably had very different experiences with their school counselor when they were in school. So we wanna make sure they understand that the role has evolved and what it is that we do in today's schools. And of course, yes, and what they're doing in this advisory council. So both of those pieces need to be thoroughly explained in the first meeting. But if it's not the first meeting and this is just the fall meeting, then you'll do a brief overview of that. And then you'll dive in to those reports and school data and other information collected previously. So we'll kind of do a review of that because you're kind of thinking of this fall meeting as the beginning of the year meeting. So you wanna look at that data, then you wanna start looking at the plan for that year. So you would explain to your advisory council how because of that data, you've now created these calendars and goals to help it positively impact that data. So you might show them the previous data and then talk about what you hope the data will be as a result of your school counseling program the following year. Okay, so that's those outcome goals. 
We want to make sure they understand that because likely they've never heard about your school counseling program goals. They don't know about what all you have listed as your, your goals for the year and what data you've collected and what data you hope to improve and that sort of thing. So we really want to include them in that. As we have those discussions, we want to make sure, again, we're giving them plenty of time to ask questions, to reflect, to give feedback on all of that. All right, I'm going to pause right here for just a second. I told you I would be reminding you about our quote at the beginning, because if you already feel overwhelmed by this, like if you're thinking, but I don't have a calendar, a formal calendar, and so I can't have this fall meeting because I don't have a calendar to share with them. No, 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 no. Don't think like that because it is better to have the meeting and to begin forming your advisory council, even if you don't have every component and you will work towards those things. That's okay. We know we can't implement all of this overnight. So if you don't have student outcome goals yet, it's okay. You can still move forward with your advisory council. You can even say, to them that one of your goals for the year is to start implementing student outcome goals. Maybe they could even help you write those student outcome goals based on data you have. This advisory council is a group there to help you. So don't be afraid of having this group and having these meetings just because you don't have all the components in place yet. Really, I see it the opposite way. I see that when I implemented my advisory council, then the other things started falling into place because I had a group to help me. So I'll talk more about that when I talk about my experience with this, but keep that in mind. If perfect was starting to be the enemy of good, pause that, stop that thinking, come back with me and remember, it's okay if we can't do it all. What I'm presenting to you is a ideal advisory council and we don't have to be at ideal right away we can work towards it all right so then that spring meeting the second meeting of the year typically near the end of the year would be a summary so you would then share those goals if you had them and share the data that to update them on the results reports and and if you were able to reach those goals it's okay if you didn't but sharing the data is really really important and then you'll also spend time in that end of year meeting discussing program improvement for the next year okay so it's pretty easy that fall meetings really the getting ready the plans for the year and then that spring meetings a summary and this is purposefully not super detailed because what else you talk about in that fall meeting and that spring meeting depends on your school. So let me give a quick example here. I had an advisory council that was wonderful. It was up and running for many years and over the years it really strengthened and really grew into something I never ever imagined it would be. I was very, very, very lucky and fortunate to have such a beneficial advisory council. I truly believe you can too. I actually, I said lucky, but I don't think I was lucky. I think that advisory councils just can be that beneficial when implemented. So anyway, back to what I was saying. So I had this advisory council and at the fall meeting, I would always share our data and our plans for the year and all of that. And in that, I included some information about the number of students that received free or reduced lunch, just some of our basic demographic data. And my advisory council was very, very shocked that my school at the time had that high of a number of students receiving free or reduced lunch. They had never seen that number before and they were just very surprised by it. Because of that fall meeting and the conversation we were able to have about our student population and about the intensive needs that they had that our parents didn't even know were within our school walls, uh, my advisory council decided to act on that and they decided to start a food pantry and the food pantry was available multiple times throughout the year. 
And I could go on and on about how beautiful this food pantry was and how much of a blessing it was to so many of our students and families. But all of that was because of the advisory council and sharing that data at the fall meeting. So then at the spring meeting that year, we got to talk about all the great things that came from that and the great data to support um, that free or reduced lunch data then we were able to share that data of how many families we helped through the food pantry, how many dollars raised through fundraising efforts to support the food pantry and all of that great stuff. So then that was shared at the spring meeting. It just continued to snowball. And like I said, it was just a really beautiful thing. A beautiful thing that me as a solo school counselor of 480 students that did have high needs would have never been able to do. We didn't have a social worker to help me with that. We didn't even have an assistant principal. So my principal and I carried a lot, but this great resource for our families was really the brainchild and, um, and fully implemented by my advisory council. I will note here that because it grew so rapidly, we ended up making a different committee that became the food pantry committee because it kind of took on a life of its own and Remember at the beginning, I said the advisory council really needs to have that sole purpose. So it did grow into something else, but that's okay. Again, it would have never happened if it weren't for this advisory council sharing that data in the fall meeting and then having the opportunity to reflect and discuss what else we can do during that spring meeting. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about additional meetings. I've mentioned that a couple of times, said you might have more than two meetings. So these are all optional, but as your group forms, <clears throat> you might notice that um, additional meetings just naturally arise. So this lists a couple of those that might come up. So the uh, orientation. So maybe if you have a brand new group before your first fall meeting, an orientation would be a good idea. That would be when you really share about the goals of the group, but also the goals of comprehensive school counseling. Because that could take up quite a bit of time, it's probably a good idea to do that prior to that first meeting so that it's not the only thing you do during your first meeting. It's optional. You don't have to, but it might be a good idea. I didn't know that whenever I first started, but like I said, that first meeting, I talked the whole time. I didn't leave any time for anyone else to talk, and I really tried to squeeze in way too much. And it's probably because I didn't have an orientation to the advisory council to get us started. Also, special events. That's kind of like what happened with the food pantry thing. So you might need a special meeting or an additional meeting to plan some sort of event during the school year or to, I don't know, um, let me think of another example other than my food pantry example. Oh, I know one. My advisory council also helped me write my vision and mission statement. When I was applying for RAMP, I wanted to update my vision and mission statement. And so my advisory council was the perfect group to do that. I didn't want to write those on my own because I really wanted them to be reflective of our advisory council and of our school as a whole. And my advisory council represented our school as a whole. So in order to do that, it took some extra time. So I had a special meeting that was a mission and vision writing meeting. And so that was I want to say I did that in like February or something. So it was just kind of right in the middle of the year. I don't think everyone was able to come, but most of the, the committee was, and they were very happy to do so. They were so willing to help. Again, they were amazing. Truly, truly changed my school counseling program. Um, and so that was a special meeting I called because again, it would have taken up so much of the time that it wouldn't have allowed us for other important pieces. So I wanted to do that separate. Or a response to an unusual situation. So there might be a time that your advisory council is a resource if an unexpected event occurs throughout the year. Of course, in that case, you would want to consult with your administrator first to make sure it was appropriate for them to be involved. So if it's something personal to a family or something, we would want to respect that confidentiality. But you never know 
when that might be appropriate. So keep that in mind as well. Just a couple of tips and tricks as you think about your advisory council meetings. I always recommend having a visual and a handout. I always had a little packet prepared for them. I usually also had a slide deck prepared so that we could go through that data in a really easy and efficient way. I always had snacks. I'm never going to ask you to come to a meeting of mine without snacks. Having a minute taker is really, really valuable, especially if you're a solo school counselor. If you have a team, I recommend one of the other school counselors doing that. But if you don't, asking a colleague that you trust to really take really detailed minutes is helpful. That will make more sense when I show you my example. The minutes get pretty detailed and you want them to be. And also we've already talked about that, but really having that time for discussion, but having questions ready if no one has questions or thoughts to discuss. So you don't want the meeting to end super early because no one's sharing anything, but you also want to allow them to openly share if, if they're wanting to or needing to. And then what to, just a couple of things of what to avoid. Like I said, we don't want to add this to another committee meeting. It needs to be a standalone group. We don't want to talk about the same thing at every meeting. So if you find a lot of turnover and you're only talking about what the purpose of your meeting is, that's when you might want to have that separate orientation. So if you have large amount of turnover just one time and you need to do that, then that's okay. But if it's happening every time, then of course you're not being very purposeful. We also want to avoid doing all the talking. I know that we can get nervous and just want to share and fill the silence, but, but avoiding that is, is a best practice. Oops. Um, also unwilling to change. That is something we should avoid because this group is a group of stakeholders there to help us grow and change. And of course, we don't want to be scared of data and goals ever, but especially in our advisory council as well. So just a few success stories of why an advisory council is so beneficial. Like we said, brainstorming is more effective. I really can't stress this enough for those solo school counselors. We don't have people to just bounce ideas off of all the time. And so having that advisory council really increases that effectiveness of brainstorming. Like I said, adds input if you're that lone wolf counselor. Uh, then these next couple of things are just things that happened because and or as a result of my advisory council. My advisory council helped me create a needs assessment. That was very beneficial because it was a needs assessment that went out to parents and caregivers. And so I got to get the feedback of some parents and caregivers and other stakeholders as I made that. So they were able to say things I didn't think of, like, can't remember exactly. I think that I had it as a Likert scale because that's something as school counselors we're very familiar with, but the parents found my scale a little confusing. And so they shared that with me. So we changed the format of it. And again, something I would have never thought about, but having those extra minds come together made it so much more beneficial. Same as we discussed what questions should be asked the parents and teachers and other perspectives in the group really opened my mind to things I wouldn't have thought of. I already mentioned that my mission and my vision statement were, were written by, by my advisory, which was amazing and so helpful. And they did such a great job. And I just will be forever grateful for their support and that. And I will make the side note, I mentioned that that was for RAMP. And the ramp reviewers loved that my advisory council helped to write those. They, I got good scores on that because it wasn't done just by me in isolation. Those additional resources, like I said, that food pantry and different things like that, that just never would have come about. We had several other really cool stories come about because Different advisory council members had connections with the community that I didn't have, and they were able to really help out. We had a high population of students in foster care, and we had a advisory council meeting that knew people at DHS and just were able to provide some additional communication and supports there. We just had 
some amazing things. And of course, through all of that, we were never breaking confidentiality. My advisory council never knew specific student names or anything like that. Even the food pantry, it was set up in a way that the, the stakeholders that supported that food pantry filled it and helped organize it and fundraise for it and all of that, but they never were face-to-face -face with the recipients of it. So confidentiality was always maintained. And it just, I could go on and on about all the great success stories. An advisory council is such a powerful tool. All right, so let's talk about the template. The template includes both an agenda template and a minutes template. So ASCA has created both of those for your use. So I am going to stop sharing for just a moment and bring those up for you. So let's take a look. So this is the agenda that ASCA provides. Again, this can be just be found on ASCA's website. And it's so great, just like all their templates. You can just put in the information so easily without having to reinvent the wheel, without having to think through what should you be putting on the agenda, that sort of thing. This template is pretty basic. It really just has you include your mission statement, but if you don't have one, you write in there. Currently do not have a mission statement plan to write one with my counseling or my advisory council in the near future or something like that. Same with student outcome goals. If you, for your school counseling program, don't have student outcome goals, you could include the school-wide goals that are included in there. And then here, you'll just uh, write down the agenda items. And then in this right-hand column, the school counselor that will be addressing those. For me, I just deleted that column because I was the only school counselor, so I didn't want to write my name over and over again there. But you can see here that it's pretty basic, but it does allow you to, to remember those important elements. All right. Now let's jump over to the minutes so that you can see what that one looks like. Oh, went to the same one. Sorry about that. Try again. Okay, these are the minutes. So again, pretty um, similar to what we just looked at, except it gives you a place to write the members that were present. You can copy and paste those agenda items in here, but then you can write a little bit of discussion summary. So what was talked about as a result of that agenda item. And then if there's action needed, state it there and the person who's responsible for that action needed. I love how ASCA set this up. It actually wasn't set up like this when I was in the school setting and applying for ramp this changed a little bit in the fourth edition but i think this is really wonderful makes this very easy and super under easy to understand and it's just really great so i hope that you find that beneficial and helpful as you create your agenda and your minutes and like i said in the when we were talking about our the presentation and what that should look like. We want to make sure that somebody is taking those minutes for us because you're going to be busy, I promise you. You're going to be trying to organize everybody and talk and get your slide deck playing and get snacks ready and everything else. And so someone else taking those minutes is really important. But using that template makes it super easy. All right, I'm going to go back to screen sharing again, as much as I know you probably love seeing my face up here. <laughs> okay, I always have a million different screens up here. It's always so easy. Okay, here we go. All right. So again, just as a reminder, those can all be found on ASCA's website. So implementation steps. This is a list of just the short implementation steps to help get that advisory council up and running. So we want to determine the stakeholders for representation on our advisory council. We want to develop those agendas, then make sure that we explain and discuss that school data and those important elements with our advisory council. Of course, recording those minutes, 
analyzing and incorporating feedback. So don't forget to pay attention to what your advisory is asking for. We want to make sure we're really using their feedback. It's so valuable. Using that data, sharing that data that demonstrates the value of our school counseling program. And then making sure that we use our presentation skills to share that with them. So we want to make sure they have a really good understanding of our data, of our action plans, and all of that. We want to make sure they, they get it. We want to brag a little bit. I know that's not always easy for us as school counselors, but it's super important. All right, so I am now going to jump over to an example. So hopefully you can still see my screen. So we're going to look at a couple different examples. We're gonna look at that example of email inviting participants, an example agenda, example minutes, and a planning worksheet. So first here is an example email inviting counseling uh, advice, uh, Council advisory council <laughs> participants. Look, I even called it a counseling advisory up here because I always get it confused. <laughs> I did used to be different in the third edition in my defense, and that's what I applied for ramp for. But you can see here, this is just explaining why we were having this group. So I explained a little bit about ASCA. I invited them to be a part of it. And then I would always include the dates as well. This is just an example. And like I said, in this book, the implementation guide ASCA provides a great example too. It's probably even better than mine. All right, so now let's look at an example agenda. So like I said, this was from before I before ASCA had the great template because I applied for ramp in the third edition. So the template's even better, but I just want you to see here and the same things were included. It just doesn't look as good as the new ASCA template, but I still started with those goals, reviewing data, talked about an action item. We always talked about hurdles and challenges or special events and experiences. We talked about planning because this was the spring meeting. So we wanted to start wrapping our head around planning for the next year. And then that time there at the end for recommendations, comments, suggestions, ideas, all of that. So this was just a really basic agenda that I would use whenever I was creating my agendas. Again, making sure that I had enough agenda items, but leaving plenty of time to chat as well. You might also see this document up here, um, Update of Active Programs. That was a document I made each year that just gave a summary of the things happening in my school counseling program. I didn't always spend a lot of time going over that because of time, but it was always included in the folder I would give them. So it was always a little file that included all of that. That had data, participation data especially, but also some outcome data as well. All right, so then this was the minutes from that same meeting that I just showed you the agenda for. These were the minutes. So you can see how long they are. It's seven pages um, and it's not all loading right now. Oh, I guess it's not seven pages, five pages. Okay, five pages, but still it's pretty long. It took a um, this one page agenda into five pages because of how detailed the minutes were. And thank goodness I had a good minute writer because I would not have been able to track all of this. But this is really important, especially if you want to apply for ramp, you need really, really detailed minutes, but not just for ramp. Minutes are so helpful to make sure you don't miss anything and that you're able to reflect on what happened during the meeting. As so you can see here in attendance, I had that district superintendent, which was amazing. My principal, I had a speech pathologist and a special ed teacher. You can see there just the different people I had present at that meeting. It wasn't always that same group. It looks like I had a couple absent. I had a kindergarten teacher that was typically there, but she must have not been able to make it then. But you can see it's still a pretty diverse group. You can see my welcome, my review of the purpose, review of the goals. I also always talked about the steps taken to meet those goals, update of those active programs. 
At this point, you can see that some of my members gave some feedback. So we had some parents and some students sharing about their experience, which was really great. And I'm so glad that was captured in the minutes so that I could really reflect on that as I went forward planning for my school counseling program. I've reviewed the data. I did a little slide deck for that. You can see there my principal commented, uh, a couple of other people commented, great conversation. Here's where we were working about re, uh, rewriting our mission statement, rewriting our vision statement. You can see there some of the discussion that was happening. So what we did was we had had a separate meeting to talk about that, and then we finalized it in this meeting. So we did most of the work during a working meeting that was separate. Then we finalized it in our end of the year meeting all together. Then you can see here, we did some planning for 2018 and 2019, but here's where you can see where I messed up a little bit. Luckily, there was a great conversation throughout, but I had several agenda items here that got tabled because we were running out of time. So I went ahead and tabled those and then I opened the floor for comments or questions because I didn't wanna miss that part. Uh oh, so, Keep that in mind. I filled the agenda too full. We did have great conversation, but it's okay to have too many items. Just be comfortable with some of the items ending up getting tabled. And then we had a closing. So you can see there those minutes. This is just a, you can't see that very well, but this was a Prezi that I used at one of our meetings to review different things and different data. So that was just a snapshot of that. And then this document I wanted to show you, this is something I created when I've presented on this topic before. And I'm more than welcome to share this with you. If you'll email me, I can give it to you. This is just a way to begin thinking through the planning of your advisory council. So it's just a way to start brainstorming potential members, potential dates, what you wish stakeholders knew about your school counseling program, some things to do before, some things to do after, that sort of thing. I just made this, like I said, for a presentation on advisory councils before, but you don't have to use it, but I just wanted to share that we had it in case it would be helpful. So those are some of the examples. If you have this book, again, great examples in here as well, probably even better and aligned with the fourth edition. I admit that my example agenda and minutes are from the third edition. So we didn't have that beautiful template, but it's the same information, just not in the template, but please use the template. No reason to reinvent the wheel. All right, I hope that was helpful. So let's quickly go through some reflection questions. Maybe you already have your advisory council up and running. Maybe you just are looking to improve it. So here are some great growth questions as you reflect on your advisory council. First, how is your advisory council developed and provide really good examples or really accurate examples. So maybe your advisory council was developed because you put a sign up sheet out and whoever signed up was a part of it. That's okay, but maybe you can think through how you'll select members in the future or how you will develop it with a little more intention in the future. Same with selecting members. That third question, how can you improve the way in which the advisory council offers meaningful feedback to your program? So if you have an advisory council and you don't feel as excited about it as I do, then think through about what you could change to make it more meaningful. I just, I can't stress enough how meaningful it can be. I had such great success with this. And so small tweaks might really make a big difference. And then also reflecting on what ways your advisory council strengthened or changed your comprehensive school counseling program. We've got to celebrate those successes. That's a great thing to share with them too. I probably didn't do a good enough job of telling them just how much my school counseling program changed as a result of them. So making sure you share that because that's super exciting and even more things to brag about. So in summary, this is just a quick, what I would consider the five most important steps. We wanna determine those members and invite them. We wanna create the agenda 
We want to conduct the meeting, reflect on the meeting, and then do a little bit of future planning. Like I said, we spent a lot of time talking about the details of each of those five steps. But if you need to start small, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Just do these five things. Determine members, create an agenda, conduct the meeting, reflect on the meeting, and just do a little bit of tweaking for how it can be better in the future. Don't get overwhelmed by the data piece. Don't get overwhelmed by the goal setting piece. Don't get overwhelmed by all the little things that seem overwhelming. Instead, just get started. Try to do it through the lens of best practices, but just get started. And don't be afraid to communicate and rely on this group at other times throughout the year. I had this group on a little group in my email where I just could send them, you know, my whole advisory council an email at the same time. And I would often share updates with them throughout the year. Or if I was trying to get volunteers for something, I would include them. I never made them feel pressured or expected to do more than attend the two meetings, but I wanted to include them because they loved being a part of it. And they were so excited to be so involved in our school counseling program. And they learned so much about what we do as school counselors, things they would have never learned if they wouldn't have been a member of this advisory council. And I truly think that they appreciated that and liked it as much as I liked them being a part of it. So don't be afraid to rely on them and to communicate with them. And with that, we have finished our advisory council presentation. So you can take a big deep breath, Hopefully it doesn't feel too overwhelming. Hopefully you can really understand how this would help serve your students. It really truly adds a whole group of people that are committed to building your school counseling program, to making it even stronger, making the work you do even more effective. And how great is that for our kids? As always, if I can help in any way, please reach out. I shared several documents with you today. I never, ever want you to feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. Please just email me and I will happily share those documents with you if they would be helpful or if you have any other questions about how to implement an advisory council as a part of your comprehensive school counseling program. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I hope that it has been helpful. As always, thank you for all you do to serve your students. I am forever and ever grateful for you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you at our next webinar. Bye.